Taiwan has been described as having an economic miracle. And when they talk about that, they're referring to rapid growth from the 1960s all the way to the 90s. And it, it was miraculous in many ways. People were mm -hmm. lifted out of poverty. A middle class was created that would eventually start demanding democratic freedom that would also lead to political changes. Mm -hmm. But this economic miracle, as is the case in many fast economic spurts, led to rather massive environmental destruction. Taiwan pretty soon became notorious for filthy air, nasty water. It was it was bad. The Taiwan History Podcast for Mosa Files is made possible through the generous sponsorship of the Frank C. Chen Foundation. For Mosa Files. Yeah. And it wasn't just pollution. The new wealth created consumer demand for exotic pets and exotic meats and uh, so-called traditional medicine. Okay, that's interesting. Um, we'll we'll talk more about air and water pollution in a second. But yeah, let's focus on a couple of animal stories. And some of these stories might seem a little bit odd, but they really do help encapsulate the, the wild late years of Taiwan's economic miracle. So this is a time when Taiwan is newly free, uh, comparatively, mm -hmm. compared to what it was all, you know, during the Cold War and all that. And it's a wash in money. So we've got all of these kind of uh, bizarre, illegal wildlife activities going on. That was disgraceful. Yes. I have a lot of personal experience, but I can't name names. But you let's bet. just say uh, during those times, you would come across stuffed wildlife, an endangered sea turtle here or a bird of paradise there, tiger pelts, parks with cages, uh, monkeys inside, private zoos, really bad. Yeah, I remember actually reading in one of your books, Formosan Odyssey, you wrote about a craze for orangutan pets in Taiwan. Before my time here, but yes, there was a television show in the 80s featuring a family with a cute young orangutan. Okay, I uh, don't have to guess here. Because the TV show had a cute orangutan, everybody decided they want one, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So orangutans are, uh, you know, obviously one of our closest relatives. I love these animals. They're gorgeous, but they are wild animals and, and they grow up. So anyway, yeah. Taiwan is not a place where orangutans naturally exist. So how did this, how did this happen? They were brought in uh, illegally. It wasn't illegal to have them in Taiwan. They didn't have a, a law against it at the time. They were smuggled in from uh, Borneo. And Taiwan as not a member of the UN and all of that. They were also not a member of any of those like uh, conventions on trade for endangered species, right? Taiwan was not a member of uh, CITES. That's the Convention on the International Trade uh, in Endangered Species. They would eventually pass a, a Wildlife Conservation Act in 89. But uh, previously, yeah, you could have orangutans in Taiwan. So you said they were smuggled in from uh, the island of Borneo. That's Indonesia, right? Getting them mm -hmm. here must have been just horrible for the animals. Yeah, poor poor baby orangutans. The capturing, the smuggling, a lot of them would have uh, would have died before they I got here. Mm -hmm. yes. Sad. Very, very sad. We we don't know how many animals came into Taiwan, but there was some record somewhere like 300 were actually registered as pets. But as we know, most people even today don't bother mm. registering their pets. Um, so there's probably a lot more than that number. And that means a lot of really sad deaths. Yeah. A lot of these, they would just be kept secretly right. or abandoned. People would just uh, take them out to the hills and um, leave them. Very unfortunate. There must have been orangutan encounters. Uh, I've not seen any recent uh, stories, but uh, if we go back to the 90s, yes, surprisingly common, there would be stories exaggerated by the media, of course, but huge orangutans running wild, people getting injured, trying to capture them, scary encounters in the hills, uh, sometimes running on streets. Right. Orangutans can live for 40 something years. So mm. per perhaps they've pretty much all passed on by this time. But at that time, I guess they'd be hanging out in the kind of like foothills. Mm hmm. I remember uh, reading in the Taipei Times uh, in the summer of 2000. I used that in uh, Formosa and Odyssey, that story. Picture this. It's dawn, a hiking trail on Daokang. That's a mountain near Taichung City, right? Two elderly men, their surname Tsai, 67, and Chen, 65. They're getting some exercise and fresh air. And Daokang guess is... what they meet? 
<laughs> they're out there getting some air and they meet an orangutan. Yeah, the orangutan seems to be uh, begging for food. Uh, the two old hikers didn't have any food on them. Uh, orangutan became agitated and attacked them. Ouch. So, uh, yeah, if you're going hiking in <laughs> Taichung, bring some orangutan food. No, actually Take don't. Food, yeah. <laughs> no. no. I've actually got a copy of the article here. There's a line that's always struck me. It's quite memorable. Tsai said the male orangutan pulled off Tsai's pants and tried to grab his genitals during a tussle, which lasted almost 20 minutes. You said they were hungry, not uh, hungry for love. Oh, my uh, goodness. 20 minutes, a tussle with an orangutan pulling off your pants. That's a long 20 minutes. Uh, it gets worse. The orangutan <laughs> releases Tsai and then turns his anger to... Oh, well, anger or possibly affections. Let's, you know, let's be fair to the orangutan. Yeah, the orangutan <laughs> uh, turns to Chen. Okay. The report says... He wrangled with it for an hour or so oh, and this finally <laughs> succeeded by whispering gentle words <laughs> to persuade the animal to let go of him. I think this has to be exaggerated. Wrestling yeah. for an hour or so, that is an incredibly long time. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's a bit dubious, isn't it? But we do have two men who end up found by other hikers and sent to, to the hospital. They're in intensive care. They, they make it. But uh, yeah, really happened. And and so, of course, the authorities have to respond and there has to be an oranga hunt. Yeah, firefighters and forestry workers uh, go on the trail. They catch it that same day after it eats some uh, food with uh, anesthetic pills in it. Guess the food. Oh, come on. It's bananas, of course. Medicated bananas uh, uh, followed up with a few tranquilizer shots uh, for good <laughs> measure. Okay, Eric, an interesting detail here. The firefighters got the job of catching the beast. That's not just a chance element of there happened to be a fire station nearby. In Taiwan, if, you, if you've got creatures in your neighborhood, who are you going to call? Right. For the last, yeah, for as long as most people can remember, it's been the firefighter's job. You've got a cobra in your backyard, an iguana mm -hmm. these days down in Kaohsiung and Kingdong, a wasp nest, uh, you call 119, you call the fire station. It is changing from what I understand, though. Like in Kaohsiung, they recently changed like snakes or and other things you, you can't call oh, the firefighters. Okay. Yeah, it's getting I better. I didn't know that. Yeah. Hmm. So why do you think it was firefighters? I, I really don't know. Yeah, maybe just because they had ladders or yeah, possibly. Other, other agencies resent them uh, just sitting around a lot of their time. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's bizarre. Okay, so let's finish up this orangutan story. The elderly hiker uh, recovered, yes. And uh, what about the orangutan? I don't know. It probably got sent to the Pingdong Rescue Center, which was set up in the early 90s. It's run by a remarkable zoologist called Curtis Pei. The center took in a lot of abandoned animals from the pet trade, uh, confiscated animals from smuggling shipments that were intercepted. And the center found some good homes for, for animals. Curtis Pei arranged for some orangutans to be sent to a rescue center called Monkey World in England. Uh, Monkey World is the subject of several television series. Of Somehow I think the order. orangutans would rather have been living in Pingdong than, than England. Yeah. <laughs> Weather-wise, if nothing else. Yes, yes. In any case, Taiwan did enact a conservation law that helped to rather relatively swiftly clamp down on this orangutan thing, yeah? Hard to say. Uh, probably more a case of the craze running out of steam. I mean, mm. how long would it take people to figure out that keeping a pet primate was not a good idea, right? And <laughs> especially as the animals grow, they reach mating age, their behavior becomes increasingly aggressive and unpredictable. So the law didn't stop the trade in wildlife and animal products for other things, it just largely went underground, you know, such as with uh, the illegal trade in rhino horn and tiger parts. Yes. Rhino horn and tiger parts. Uh, this always makes me sigh because it's based on this idea that the body part that you consume gives you the, the, the prowess of that particular body part. And um, sometimes it's just symbolic. So you've got the rhino mm -hmm. horn, which sticks up proudly, and uh, the tiger's male parts. And all of that is related to aphrodisiac use, which is total bleep. It's not true at all. A rhino horn is made out of keratin, right? Same thing as our hair yeah. and our fingernails, and obviously male tiger parts do not. So anyway, very, very frustrating, but many people don't remember how bad it was in the 1980s in Taiwan. Oh, really bad, 
really, really bad. Public tiger slaughters took place around the country. Yeah, butchered in public. And the parts, meat, bones, blood, head, tail, tongue, and uh, penis, uh, auctioned off to the large crowds. Hundreds of people, maybe uh, a thousand at a time, gathered for these spectacles. You're talking about the mid-1980s yes. and auction. So how much do you want for this for this leg, that kind of thing. Mm. Amazing. More than just being out in the open. Yeah. I mean, these were advertised in newspapers. Trucks would go around with loudspeakers. People would parade with the drums beating. I remember one account said that the tiger was actually in the cage with uh, the back of the truck and it's going around the town. So this public killing of tigers stopped. There was a lot of outrage, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Conservation groups, both local and foreign, also civic groups and just citizens. Yeah. Uh, and um, imagine some tourist who stumbles across one of these things uh, that that's very bad for the image of Taiwan from a, a PR perspective, not a, even a humane issue. But yeah, absolutely horrific. I want to just uh, add something to what you said before. There there are two parts to the, the use of these wild animals, two parts. So you mentioned the sort of folk elements of you take on the properties of the animal, you know, right. the tiger is strong, it's potent, it's going to help you, uh, especially the body parts, uh, right? Well, transfer to, to your specific body parts. But if you actually look at the Chinese uh, medical texts, the old ones, they have specific uses like rhino horns used for uh, infections, fevers, you know, likewise tiger bone. So there are different uses. Some are folk superstitions and others are... Uh, but so also, it's, it's possible that it's not all complete uh, lunacy. Well, it's all, mm, but uh, different kinds. Interesting. So there's two schools of this. Still today, we consume in traditional Chinese medicine, some people still, there's lizards are still snakes. Uh, there's mm. there's still various animals. But for the most part, I've talked to quite a few of traditional mm -hmm. Chinese doctors, and they've told me that there's nothing that you can get from an animal part that you can't get from a herb or from a, a, a vegetable or, or something that grows, you know, naturally. So they've, mm. they've told me that it's all replaceable, that the yes. time has come yes. to, to move on. Mm -hmm. An interesting figure who helped shine a light on uh, Taiwan's miserable tiger trade uh, in the early 1990s, an Englishman by the name of Michael Day. He you wrote about him. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a background as a conservationist. He was an advertising agency executive and gave yeah, that yeah. up and became a tiger conservationist. Mm -hmm. It was a chance encounter uh, on a camping trip in southern Thailand, 1990. He sees a tiger and he decides to change his life, he begins conservation work for tigers. Day began collecting evidence of the illegal trade in tigers with his first covert filming operation taking him to Taiwan in May 91. We can't get the rights to the song, but I'd like to play Eye of the Tiger right about now. <laughs> okay, so 1991, you did a, a good job of describing this story. So he gets on the plane from Hong Kong to Taipei and he sees what he describes as a stunningly attractive Taiwanese woman and he begins mm -hmm. chatting with her. Her name is Rebecca Chen. She works for a courier freight company in Taipei. She's in her late 20s, lives at home, and somehow Day thinks that he will not be as scrutinized at customs and immigration if he's traveling together with a female companion. So he mm. gets Rebecca Chen's ticket upgraded to first class and sort of asks her if he can go into Taiwan with her. Yeah, he doesn't explain why he thinks he'll be less of a target with this. Uh, no, it's um, a little bit Rebecca. odd, isn't it? Maybe it was just an excuse to talk to Rebecca because she was stunningly attractive. Yes. But it so does he, work out. It works out well because she plays a significant role in the sting operation. Yeah. Incredible, isn't it? You're just uh, taking a flight and you're drawn into this uh, sting operation. Yeah. Yes. So Michael Day checks into Cosmos Hotel in downtown Taipei uh, near the main train station and starts exploring the crowded, polluted traffic snout city. It was pretty bad back then. Construction for the MRT. No, I was there. It was horrific. When they dug up Zhongxiao East Road, it would take two hours to get a bus from one side to the other. It was awful. And it was so noisy. Yeah, bad. Uh, Date reconnects with Chen a few days later, and they go to Dihua Street. Have, have you been to Dihua Street? Many, many times. It's Taipei's oldest street. You've got some Japanese architecture there, I believe, and mm -hmm. it's famous 
just for dried goods, candies, and you go there just before Chinese New Year to stock up on all the stuff you need for uh, a happy Chinese New Year. Well, Famous. it used to be infamous. Yeah, it used to be infamous in uh, certain circles. Lots of pharmacies where you could find illegal animal products. Mm. And so surveys from this time found that just over a half of the pharmacies carried tiger bone wow. and the body parts of wild animals occasionally on open display. So obviously, if there's stuff on open display like that, what's going on behind closed doors is going to be 10 mm. times worse. So Day tells Chen about what he's doing and she agrees mm -hmm. to help him, right? As <laughs> She agrees wow. to join the sting operation. Such bravery and trust. Amazing. Incredible. And the first thing they do is head to... Mm. Snake Alley, which still exists in Taipei. It's a sleazy market. <laughs> it was and, and sort of is yeah. in a red light district um, that specializes in in aphrodisiacs like snake blood and turtle blood. Mm, <laughs> delicious. Yeah, Day wants to run a test on his two spy cameras. He's got one in a shoulder bag and he's got another in a hat. The lens is uh, disguised as a piece of uh, an ornament on his hat with wires, cables going down the hat uh, to, to a battery and recorder around his waist. So the story goes that uh, both Day and Chen are role-playing. They're mm -hmm. trying to draw out the, the sleaziest uh, seller of animal parts that they can. So Day is like a sugar daddy from Texas and he wants to buy something. And Chen is doing her part as the, the girlfriend or the female attendant. And she's got bright red hot pants on and a low cut blouse. Uh, it's a pretty good distraction. Mm. After a week in Taipei, uh, Day had already found 11 Chinese medicine shops with uh, tiger bone openly on sale in the front window. Wow. wow. So this is illegal, uh, of course, right. with that uh, recently enacted uh, conservation law, but it's gone underground. So he's determined to get proof of what's happening. To get proof, he's going to go looking to buy, pretending to buy a tiger cub for his gold digging girlfriend. A ti he wants an actual tiger cub. Well, he's going to be asking around. I want to buy a tiger cub. Ooh. A prison okay. for my uh, attractive young girlfriend. Ah, uh, wow. Okay, so the story goes that Chen finds a lead and mm -hmm. they go to a poodle parlor. <laughs> so uh, we're talking about a pet store, right? Yeah. But this pet store is a front for smuggled wildlife. Get into the back rooms and there you see the various animals. You got a baby orangutan for about 150,000 NT. That's roughly 5,000 US dollars. A clouded leopard and a black panther for wow. less, less than 4,000 US dollars. And all of this comes, including the cages and delivery. Wow. Yeah, wow. Clouded wow. lepers are extinct, are they not? They're extinct in the wild in Taiwan, yes. Right. But you, you have them from other countries. Wow. So from the store, from this poodle parlor, they're driven southeast of the city to meet a man who has tigers. In a scrapyard with cages, he finds seven tigers, a chimpanzee, an enormous orangutan, and a American mountain lion, all the animals in poor condition. Of course. So this is incredible, isn't it? An illegal yeah. tiger farm, basically, in, in view of a suburban neighborhood. Horrible. So he got his evidence and he returns to Taiwan in December of 1991. And mm -hmm. this time he's coming down to my neck of the woods, southern Taiwan, Kaohsiung. And Rebecca Chen, the woman he met mm -hmm. on the plane, uh, is going to help him again. So yeah, he she's gets... the heroine of the story, the hero yeah. of the story, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, she's, she's doing all the talking. She He's just smiling and filming, isn't he? But yeah. she's doing that, the hard yards. He gets to Kaohsiung by train, mm -hmm. goes to the train station bathroom and puts on his costume a big hat it helps to hide the camera and also you know it's a good it's a good character hey there i'm looking for uh, i'm looking for a tiger <laughs> that kind of thing you know so he's a big game hunter from texas looking to find a supplier of tiger skins and tiger bone wine for the u.s market which is a little bit funny because there is no market for tiger bone wine in the u.s market but anyway <laughs> yeah they're picked up by a mercedes from the, the train station they're taken to meet an illegal wildlife importer a sinister man called uh, mr chan and he casually throws a plastic bag 
across the desk and asked Day to identify the contents. It looks like a sun-dried sponge. Oh, no. What is this going to turn out to be? Day admits he doesn't know what it is. And then this chap says, human placenta. Uh. Collected from Chinese hospitals and dried with great skill, highly nutritious. Okay, I oh. know there's some people even today who, who believe that. And I'm, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to judge too much. But no, thank you. So next, uh, he brings out a tiger bone. Now that I'm going to judge. Uh, shows him, okay, mm, nice tiger bone. He mm. arranges for them to be taken to a warehouse. Michael Day and Rebecca Chen, they arrive. He switches on his video camera and Day is showing a bag of tiger bones, skins from tigers, a leopard. And uh, just to, to show that it's a real tiger, they reassemble the skeleton. You know, uh, it's said to be from Thailand, which is a nice circling back to his tiger experience. Oh, in, uh, right, Thailand, right. Yeah. He saw a tiger one night and camping in Thailand and that was what motivated him to begin this uh, this career. Mm -hmm. So Michael Day then actually comes back to Taipei in 92 or so mm -hmm. and he, this time he comes with a professional camera crew from a UK television station and they produce mm -hmm. a documentary that as I recall won some awards. Yes. I mean Day is really uh, bringing heat onto Taiwan. Uh, there are other groups uh, involved too but yeah he made a significant uh, contribution and the country is gaining a reputation you know as an environmental cesspool mm. it's got a long rap sheet we've got tigers ivory rhino horn orangutans exotic birds dolphin slaughter drift net fishing yeah but we did begin improving roughly in 1994 and part of the impetus of that change was because of trade sanctions that were imposed on taiwan by the united states yes 1994 the united states imposed trade sanctions on taiwan punishment for the the country's poor efforts with a uh, cracking down on the endangered species trade uh, in particular tiger bones and uh, rhino horn the sanctions were on one wildlife products, not mainstream products, okay. not electronics, textiles, anything, just wildlife products, coral, shell jewelry, butterflies, crocodile skin shoes, things like that. Not worth very much, 25 million or so a year, but it was incredibly embarrassing for Taiwan. It was a big loss of face. Okay. So the US only targets this small little sector that is worth mm. like something like $25 million a year, which compared to the other stuff that Taiwan was making a electronics, bicycles, and you name it is nothing, right? $25 million a year. Mm -hmm. But because it was so embarrassing to be the, the only one that was on this list of offenders, the authorities started taking things a bit more seriously. And of course, you know, you have this educated elite that don't feel too good about some of this uh, barbaric wildlife trade. And just stuff. in general, it was changing. People were- Changing quickly. Yes. Right. They were developing a, a more international mindset. And uh, it was just time right about then when people People started to to say enough is enough. Yeah. So the government, civil groups, the people of Taiwan, they, they worked hard to turn things around. Education and punitive legislation alongside cultural shifts meant that Taiwan changed and changed quickly. And it's no longer the environmental cesspit it once was. It's improving and it's improving pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, we still have a lot of problems, but so does everyone. Uh, we have problems with stray animals. Uh, shark fin soup is still something that uh, many people are not able to give up, but we're moving in the correct direction. And also we should mention progress with pollution in general when it comes to air and water and all of that. There's been some huge strides for Forward. Yes, huge progress. I talk to young people sometimes, uh, people in junior high school today in the in the 2020s, and you know they they only see the negative sides. They're like, oh, there's garbage, there's this, and the, the. but they weren't here in 1995, and of course we still need to clean up garbage. But it's uh, it is amazing when you look at where we've come from. Yes, if I had to pick one example of progress, it's probably from your backyard, uh, Love River. Mm, the Love River. When I was a kid, it was it was a place you didn't want to be near. It stank. Sometimes you'd see a, a carcass of some animal floating in it. It wow. was just, it was nasty. And it was roughly at late 90s or so, they started mm -hmm. making a serious effort to clean it up. And today, people do hold hands and have romantic strolls along the aptly named Love River. And it is the centerpiece of Kaohsiung. Yeah, it's a great story. Okay, well, that's going to have to do it for this episode. It's uh, a mix of sad stories, but 
also some major progress was made, so we're going to try to make that a, a positive ending. And uh, this has been for most of Files. I'm Eric All Michael right. Smith. Take food when you go hiking. Uh, this is John Ross. <laughs> All Bye. right. Catch you later.